Today's webinar is titled, A Residence Guide to Creating Safer Communities for Walking and Bicycling. And we will be speaking with Tamara Redman, Federal Highway Administration's Office of Safety, Laura Sant, Associate Director of the Pedestrian Bicycle Information Center, Eva Garcia with the City of Brownsville, Texas, Ramiro Gonzalez, also the City of Brownsville, Texas, and John Paul Schaefer with Livable Memphis. My name is James Gallagher, and I am the PBSD Communications Manager. I will be facilitating today's webinar. This webinar has been submitted to AICP and may be approved for one and a half CM credits. The Road Safety Academy is the training and education arm of the UNC Highway Safety Research Center and is a registered provider of CM credits. For more information on the Road Safety Academy, please visit www.rsa.unc.edu. For more information on future webinars or to view the archives from this webinar series and others, please visit www.headbikeinfo.org slash webinars. You can also stay abreast of PBIC webinars and other PBIC news by following us on Facebook at facebook.com slash pedbike. In addition to these webinars, PBIC offers four different in-person training courses to provide technical assistance to professionals and community members in developing pedestrian safety action plans and in improving conditions for walking. These courses can be found at pedbikeinfo.org slash get training. Now I'd like to welcome and thank Tamara Redman, Laura Sant, Eva Garcia, Ramiro Gonzalez, and John Paul Schaefer for their presentations today. We'll take questions at the end. Tamara, please take it from here. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I wanted to talk, take a few minutes to talk about a few of um, the DOT and the Federal Highway Administration's initiatives, um, both the Office of the Secretary of Transportation and the Federal Highway Administration and the Department of Transportation as a whole are very interested in increasing safety for pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, I wanted to talk about a couple of the Secretary's initiatives that were recently announced. Um, late last year, the Secretary announced an initiative to reduce pedestrian and bicyclist injuries and fatalities through a comprehensive approach that addresses infrastructure safety, education, vehicle safety, and data collection. That's called the Secretary's new initiative on ped bike safety. And you can follow the link that's listed to get information on that and to see the Department of Transportation's action plan. Um, this is an 18-month campaign, and it's got several components to it. Um, one thing that it started with and is currently ongoing are road safety assessments that are currently being conducted in each state, and those are being organized and led by different um, offices within the Department of Transportation, field offices. Um, also throughout the 18-month period, we'll be highlighting different resources as they become available to help communities build streets that are safe for people and for walking and bicycling and for taking public transportation. The Mayor's Challenge was announced recently, and um, again, there's information on, and there's a web um, that you can click on or look at for more information. about. Basically, Secretary Fox is challenging mayors and local elected officials to take um, actions to improve pedestrian, improve safety for bicyclists and pedestrians over the next year. Uh, cities that elect to participate in the challenge will be invited to attend the Mayor's Summit for Safer People and Safer Streets that will take place in March. I believe the date is March 12th that they decided on. And their cities will spend a year helping their communities undertake seven different activities identified to improve pedestrian safety. Um, I also wanted to talk about a couple of um, recently completed um, uh, documents and from the Federal Highway Administration. And Bike Safe, um, Bicycle Safety Countermeasure Selection System is an online tool that provides the user with a list of possible engineering, education, or enforcement treatments to improve, improve bicycle safety based on user input about a specific location. And there will be a webinar about this resource um, next week on the 19th of February from 2 to 3.30. I also wanted to talk briefly about the Road Diet Informational Guide um, that recently came out late last year. Um, it, guides the reader through the decision-making process to determine if road diets are a good fit for a certain corridor. Um, and there's also going to be a webinar on that on March 3rd from 1 to 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And right now, Laura Sant is going to talk about the residence guide 
and the process. Okay, thank you, Tamara. Can everybody see my screen, hopefully? Um, so I'm Laura Sant. I'm with the UNC Highway Safety Research Center. We worked with Federal Highway Administration and with our partner VHB to develop this guidebook, the Residence Guide for Creating Safer Communities for Walking and Biking. And you can see the link is, is there on the slide as well as in the invite you may have received when you signed up for the webinar. Um, I'm, we worked on this guide and its predecessor, so I'm going to give you a little bit of background on how this guide was developed and kind of highlight the key elements and takeaway messages that you'll find within it. So our motivation for this guide is we, we talk with a lot of communities and one of the main concerns we hear about is um, from community members is about safety and that's one of the top barriers to walking and biking more often. And at the same time, community members are a really critical part of the solution to addressing some of those safety challenges. Uh, community members as well as agency staff and elected officials are what we consider to be one of the the three legs of the, of the stool in supporting pedestrian and bicycle friendly communities. So we developed this guide with the intent to help residents be more effective in their efforts to promote pedestrian and bicycle safety and to provide a comprehensive set of resources that they can use to identify issues, communicate those challenges to the elected officials and the agency staff they may be working with, um, to build productive relationships with other groups, and um, to also build a vocabulary for understanding what kind of treatment um, may be applicable to help solve some of the problems that they're facing. And we also wanted this guide to provide inspiration, um, to show what other communities are doing, what community members and residents can, can do um, to help promote safety and to, to be able to give them some ideas on how they can take action. So I mentioned that we had a, a precursor. The earlier version of this guide was called a Residence Guide for Creating Safe and Walkable Communities. Um, this was funded by Federal Highways and came out in 2008. And it quickly became one of the top resources downloaded from PBIC's library. Um, and in 2010, we received funding from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration um, to pilot test the guide. And so we worked through a competitive process to select 15 community groups across the U.S. Um, these groups worked with us over the course of a year to use the guide um, when they were working on their local activities. And um, through a series of meetings, provide us feedback on what they were doing, how they were using the guide, what was working, um, and what kind of places they would like more guidance or, or more information that could help them um, be more effective in some of their efforts. And so we learned a whole lot from these community groups and a lot of that, um, what we learned was, was used to, to create this um, more recent version of the guide. And what we heard most often was that um, the guide was helpful having a lot of resources in one place, but communities needed very specific step-by-step -step instructions for certain things. And, Almost every community, regardless of where they were or what size of um, neighborhood group they were, almost all of them were working on some kind of doing a walkabout or a safety audit. Many of them were planning events to engage other residents and, and people within their communities. A lot of them were using social media and trying to learn more about fundraising. So those were key areas where they asked for more content in this newer version of the guide. Um, they also, even though the first guide focused on pedestrian issues, a lot of these groups were concerned about bicycle safety as well, and so we've added bicycling as a new component um, to the guide. And they also just wanted more examples, more real-life stories from, from what other communities were experiencing to give them um, a sense of, of what can be done and, and inspiration. And so this guide is, is our attempt to incorporate all the feedback that we heard from those pilot communities. Um, but also to incorporate some of the best practices they were doing and, and what we learned from watching them work um, in their communities over the course of the year. And I want to acknowledge Livable, Livable Memphis, um, who's going to be speaking after, um, after me on the, today's panel. Um, they were one of the 15 pilot communities, and we learned a whole lot from them in that process, and we're really excited that they could join us today. And um, 
and many thanks to, to all the communities who were part of that pilot effort. So now I'll just walk through um, each of the six sections of the guide and give you a sense of how it addresses some of the common um, concerns and barriers that um, communities may experience um, when seeking to address pedestrian and bicycle safety issues. So the first section is about identifying problems. And one of the things that we heard from the pilot communities is that a lot of times they get really stuck um, if they start with thinking about a solution and, and bringing that to the engineer. Um, a lot of communities would say, you know, we need an overpass or we need a signal. And they would bring that request to the local engineer. And the first thing that the engineer would say is, well, that's not appropriate. That's not the right solution. And the dialogue would stop or the relationship would get really confrontational at that point. And so um, what we learned from the, the pilots who were being really successful and the concept that we really try to stress in this guide is the importance of documenting the problem uh, before becoming too wedded to any particular solution. So this chapter gives you some tools for how to identify the issues and the process um, to document the problem through walkabouts or other kinds of um, activities. And I think this really helps lay the foundation for, for getting the buy-in of some important partners that, that you need to help address the problems that you're seeing um, being documented. And so that leads us into chapter two, which is about building partnerships. And again, one of the things that we learned from the communities is um, the groups that had kind of a us versus them adversarial relationship with their um, local transportation agencies weren't getting as far. Um, and the places that were making a lot of progress tended to have really strong relationships with the city staff um, in the public works and the planning department, and also had typically broader coalitions of partners, um, including folks in public health, um, working with local universities, as is being done in Memphis, and um, also New Orleans, I believe, um, working with law enforcement, working with the disability community. Um, so at this section covers a number of different partners that could be involved in um, community groups efforts to improve pedestrian and bicycle safety and how to make your partnerships inclusive and in working with with diverse people um, and then that really takes us into the the third section which is on identifying solutions and again one of the things that we heard from community groups is is that to be effective, they really need to be working in a lot of different areas. Um, you can't really get hung up on one engineering project that you want to see because that may take a number of years to actually break ground. Um, so in the meantime, there are a lot of different things that could be done on the education side, on the enforcement side, and on building encouragement and outreach throughout the community um, that can be done to, to have some immediate successes that can then build up to longer term projects. And so this section covers a number of different ways um, that community members can be involved um, in helping raise awareness about pedestrian bicycle safety issues as they seek um, longer term policy and, and engineering changes. And one of the resources that I'd like to call out is a supplemental piece on engineering that we developed. We heard a lot of the pilot community say that they just didn't have good engineerese. They didn't have the vocabulary to talk with the engineers about what the right solutions were. And they felt like sometimes their engineers didn't know the range of possibilities that could be implemented to improve safety at a particular location. So we put this piece together to sort of summarize very briefly um, some key engineering facilities, both pedestrian and bicycling, um, and give some answers to common questions and some answers to um, things that engineers may be considering when thinking about these solutions and where they may be appropriate so that this can help inform residents and, and kind of give them a more equal playing field when they have those conversations with their engineering staff. And section four is um, on additional resources. One of the things we heard from the pilots is that most of their groups are volunteer-based. They don't have a lot of time to reinvent the wheel. If there are already existing materials or trainings or things that they can use to spread pedestrian and bicycle safety messages, they want to have those at their fingertips. 
Um, so this section gives um, a lot of key resources, research. It has links to web-based trainings and videos that communities can take and run with. Um, and it also gives a description and, and links to other um, local and national resources, um, including different advocacy groups. Um, through which they could find folks in their community who might be able to join their efforts or help support whatever they're working on. And then the fifth section of the guide is about success stories. And this is really the heart of the guide. Um, this is where you see all of those concepts from the earlier chapters in action. Uh, we have 12 different communities that we profile. Um, they represent urban, suburban, and rural areas. They're all working on different things. Um, but what we try to do is, is give a sense of who they're working with, um, where they're finding funding, um, how they're making their plans, how they're doing their outreach, and what they're learning along the way. And you'll hear more from Brownsville and Memphis, um, but we have um, really a great collection of communities, and, and I'm really thankful for all the folks who provided info um, to help us include their stories in this guide. And finally, the last section of the guide provides um, 12 different resources. And these are really intended to be kind of tearaway documents that you can print and take out into the field with you as you start um, engaging with the community or if you're, if you're beginning to plan a strategy um, for improving walking and biking. Um, these are uh, where you get into the nuts and bolts of some things like planning a walkabout, um, planning events, doing fundraising, fundraising or working with social media. And we also have a number of um, kind of sample materials. So if you want to see an example of a community resolution or if you're engaging in um, outreach to drivers or other pe or even law, um, law enforcement or um, elected officials in your community, you can see a number of materials for making the case or for raising awareness about pedestrian and bicycle issues. So that's really the guide in a nutshell. And I want to leave as much time as possible to hear what the what the communities are doing, because that's really where we learned a lot about um, how to make progress in improving pedestrian and bicycle safety um, from the community perspective. And I will turn it over now to Ramiro. OK. Um, great. My name is Eva Garcia, and I'm here with Ramiro Gonzalez. Ramiro Gonzalez, and we are from the city of Brownsville. So um, our presentation today is about making connections between health and transportation. And like Laura said, our city did focus a lot about health. And the reason being, our background is we're in the southernmost point of the continental United States along the US and Mexico border. Um, we are a mid-sized city with a population of about 175,000. 93% um, of our population is Hispanic. Our median age is around 29. So the issues or, you know, um, when the, the guy talks about identifying your problem, our problem is that one in three people are diabetic. Uh, that's 20% higher than the rest of Texas and 23% higher than the national average. 80% are either ob obese or overweight, and more than 40% live below the poverty line, which is 20,000 for a family of four. Um, when developing partnerships or building partnerships really started with the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston School of Public Health. They opened up a branch here in Brownsville, and they were really the ones that did the research on the city's health statistics, which was an eye-opener. They started the community advisory board, and it, compromised, it comprised of leaders from nonprofits, school districts, city government, um, and, and it, they opened up the Tu Salud Si Cuenta, Your Health Matters campaign, which was really about, really about getting the media involved in the problem and, and spreading the awareness of what was going on in our city. Through the UT School of Public Health, um, you know, we started branching out, identifying more of those decision makers, all the agencies responsible for making improvements. And um, together, United Brownsville, B-Metro, um, you know, all these entities, they started developing a vision together. And I'll let Amito explain about what they did. So uh, one of the things that we, that we quickly realized is, you know, you're not a profit in your own community. Um, so we had to bring in some speakers 
um, and to talk about what it is, uh, you know, transforming a city and, and, and pushing multimodal transportation. Um, so we we found some sponsors and we, we brought in uh, Gil Peñalosa with 8 to 80 cities. And, um, and then shortly after that, we, um, we organized a uh, TEDx Brownsville, and that's really, um, you know, we, we really just uh, basically showed the TEDx City Conference in New York, uh, I believe a year ago, last year. Um, and then quickly after that, um, we, we partnered up with AARP and their age-friendly community um, uh, program. And they brought in uh, Dan Burden, who is also a walkability expert. And he did, you know, he not only did a public presentation, but he also worked with staff. And all, all these, um, all these, these three events that you see here, we all had multiple uh, interactions with the experts, and also uh, city staff uh, was a it was a requirement to go. Um, so I mean, it, it was just a uh, bringing bringing city staff and the community together, um, and it was uh, pretty. Um, Pretty successful. So <clears throat> we had a, a group of uh, interested uh, advocates here in Brownsville, and they kept on pushing the city for um, you know paint a bike lane, strike a bike lane, and you know it was kind of a, a ragtag uh, affair there. So we said you know we have to have a master plan in process. So we went through the process. Um, we found some funding, and we had a, a pretty robust um, community campaign to to fully understand what the needs were. And a lot of the, um, you know, some of the results of those surveys were, you know, people do, people would bike more if they felt safer, and you know, um, everything that that we we all talk about, and we all um, we all know uh, that are that the issues in our city. Uh, I just want to say, yeah, those visions that, you know, were identified, they coincide a lot with the residence guide um, goals. And so to start outreach methods, um, the community advisory board used promotoras, which were briefly cha trained community health workers to talk about the health issues that families were facing. And then... Um so we took surveys. We took um, in Brownsville. We have a, a yearly festival called Charo Days, and it happened to coincide with our bike plan effort. So we bought some bikes and we we raffled them off to people that took surveys. We probably gathered over a thousand surveys. Um, so it, it really gave us a good idea of what of what it is that we had to do and where we had to go. Um, after that, you know, we, we you. You kind of have to always continue your outreach method, always gathering data. So every public event that we have, whether it's a festival or at our Ciclovias, um, which are now up to four for a year, um, we, we're always collecting data. And, and not only on the city end, but also the School of Public Health does a great job of, uh, of putting that data together in a, in a way that you can communicate it. It really continues the awareness um, of what the city's trying to create through those um, surveys. So we also partnered up with uh, the Community Development Corporation of Brownsville, um, and in, in everything they do, they try to um, they try to integrate multimodal transportation. Uh, they are a uh, low-income housing uh, organization, probably the largest in South Texas. And uh, so they are an important partner in, in developing where, where it makes sense and where uh, their residents uh, have access to uh, bikes and uh, public transportation. <clears throat> so these are the results that we, that we talked about. Um, you know, a lot of people, they, they, ex they do a they bike ride and they, they walk for, uh, for uh, exercise, uh, but you could see that uh, safety is a big concern and, you know, and facilities as well. So, um, 
you know, continuing on with the outreach efforts, we, we partner with many organizations, um, but we also have uh, bike rodeos. Um, we have um, so so that they you know the, the the kids the children are learning you know not only how to ride a bike but uh, to do it safely um, and uh, yeah to create a safe walking and biking community it's really important that you know the youth learn the skills of how to be safe on the streets um, so nonprofits and the city they they work to create these rodeos. And of course, parents have to take their children, so they too are also learning how to be safe on the streets. Um, the Bike for Tykes was developed through a grant from that School of Public Health, and they were able to buy a fleet of bicycles and rent them out for free to the public. Um, parents just had to bring their children, register them a bike, and then we took them on tours through new trails that were being built and through the parks, um, you know, walking areas. So this really allowed the, the youth to practice safety and, of course, adults to witness um, what it was like. We kept communities engaged also through our Sokolovias, like Ramiro mentioned. Um, a lot of the times our elected officials may not be present at these other activities, but they definitely try to make it out to our Sokolovias. And you can see here that we just shut down the streets and people can bike or they can walk, and we really get a lot of people out at these events. Um, this is some more pictures of Cyclobia, and you can see on the left, um, there's a map there, and what they're doing is, you know, educating um, people about the benefits of cycling, so you, you know, let them know where your house is, where you're trying to commute to, how many miles that is, and what those benefits are of traveling by bike or walking instead of using a motor vehicle. And then the two pictures on the right, we're at a bike fashion show that was hosted at our Cyclobia, and it lets you know the community know about what's out there. You don't just have to ride, um, you know, a cruiser bike. There's a folding bike. There's a low rider bike. It brings in that cool factor and really encourages people to, um, to you know, sort of be with with what's in. So these programs, all these outreach methods, and um, you know, the keeping communities engaged really resulted in some policy changes that were supported. Um, we have a complete streets resolution. We have sidewalk requirements. We have safe passing, bike parking, and NACDO guidelines. And Ramiro is really one of the leaders of pushing all these policies forward. Um, so our, you know, the city required with regards to sidewalks, um, the city in the past required the sidewalk only in residential areas, so we realized that we quickly had to change that if we wanted to, to uh, improve our pedestrian environment. So we actually, we now require sidewalks in commercial developments. Um, and the, the state passing ordinance, that's, you know, um, a, a state law. Um, it's a three-foot rule and a six-foot rule. Um, and the NACO guidelines, we actually work with our traffic department to bring them up to speed and, um, you know, so that we could adopt the NACDO guidelines. And, uh, and they, they were very, um, very supportive and, and they, they actually, they're using them now uh, quite, quite actively. Um, so the results, the, you know, public service announcements, we also created public service announcements in English and in Spanish given our our demographic and population here in Brownsville. Um, we do a lot of share the road. There's, there's a lot of share the road signs, um, and we also, uh, when you know, when we have events, we try to get sponsors for uh, lights and um, and you know, try to pass out some helmets uh, just to promote more safety and uh, so, that, so that people get more comfortable on the road. Um, we also started through the Parks Department um, a 100% volunteer operated earn a bike program. So it's really just city property um, and volunteers operated. I myself am a manager there. And what we do is we get bike mechanics to teach you know, the youth. Anybody of any age can go and work 25 hours to earn a bike. The bikes are donated through the police department 
or through community members that have bikes that they're no longer using or that their children outgrew. And so any volunteer will come, they'll learn uh, how to repair a bike, they'll learn about bike safety, they volunteer at events, and all their hours are put to earning a bicycle for themselves. So now, you know, with our low income statistics, we're giving people who can't, may not be able to afford a brand new bike a possibility to take one home with them. So that's been very successful. We also have our social riding groups, and most of these are commuter groups. The Brownsville Bike Brigade rides to, you know, events or grand openings or art galleries. Um, all of these groups do 7 at 7 Urban Assault, Babes Bike and Brunch, you know, to, to lunch or to just get together. And this like, regularly encourages people to ride, and it looks more fun when you're doing it, you know, in a group. And we've really seen a lot of results in the media. Um, they love the stories about how people are getting on the bike or walking, and it's families, it's friends, it's just the entire community. And I didn't really mention, but there's a growing number of walking groups um, in our community now, and there's definitely some sidewalk developments that we're working on and some improvements that we're making um, through the city. We, we recently, it's not on here, but we recently completed one of uh, probably the most challenging projects, which is eliminating a lane on a street, road diet. Um, uh, which is a, a major road diet. And uh, it, it was challenging, um, not only, not, I mean, but the city staff held together, uh, and we, we, we kind of, uh, we, we supported each other, and we actually made it happen. Um, but I won't go into that. Um, so the lessons shared, you know, politically, every city commissioner or at least a, a majority of your city commission uh, should be on the same page, should, communi should communicate with each other, and should also, um, you know, be aware of why exactly you're, you're, we're trying to do this. Um, and, and once again, keep the conversation going with the partners, elected officials, and more importantly, the public. You've got to let the public know what it is you're doing and how you're doing it. And look for small wins, even if it's, you know, working with your traffic department and putting down, you know, a four-foot stripe, um, you know, and then so you can, you can start there and grow from there. Uh, we, we definitely started there, and, you know, like, we, like I just mentioned, we did our first road diet um, where we, you know, we took the lane, we put a big sidewalk in, uh, and that's been, you know, uh, it, it was controversial at first, but now the community has turned around and said, you know, you did a great job with that street. Um, I just want to end with uh, this activity that I showed you in a previous slide. This was that benefits activity, and it really engaged the community at the Ciclovia um, to learn something new. You know, they became educated and aware, and it encourages them to, you know, explore your, your city more to exercise more, um, you know, to save money, to give money back to the community, and adding, like, days to your life. So you can see all the benefits here. Uh, this is my favorite activity by far that we've, that we've had at, in Brownsville. And, um, yeah, well, thank you so much for listening. Let me go ahead and change the, con the, the screen to the next presenter. Glad to be here. Uh, my name is John Paul Schaefer. I am the program director at Livable Memphis, um, which is a program of the Community Development Council of Greater Memphis. And I'm just going to give kind of an overview of uh, our work in bicycle and pedestrian advocacy, policy, public engagement, um, especially some of the programs that highlight um, our use of some of the elements of the residence guide. Uh, we are kind of one of the early adopters, so to speak, of the 2008 guide. Um, so a, a, a kind of an overview of what we've done is how do you move from advocacy to taking on kind of a, a policy role um, and even, you know, becoming sort of a funding partner for uh, public agencies uh, and, and a project manager for some of these things. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a toolkit that we've developed using some of the principles from the guide. Um, some of our work as we've gone more towards a, a statewide role. And then 
I'm going to finish up with our work on developing a complete streets uh, manual for the city of Memphis to get our, our mayor's uh, complete streets policy um, enacted. Um, yeah, I, I noticed the, uh, the chart that showed kind of what we had done using the guide. I think we could even check off a few of those boxes with, you know, the plan or the uh, health aspect of things. And funding, you know, uh, through our Mid-South Regional Green Print, we've seen a, a lot of um, kind of a regional vision and regional planning around bicycle and pedestrian uh, infrastructure and, and spaces. Um, so about Livable Memphis, uh, we are a membership organization. Uh, we work with neighborhood um, community development corporations, um, kind of the institutions and funding partners that are um, that support that industry, um, really taking a focus on neighborhood revitalization. And a big part of that, of course, is transportation access. Uh, we've also become pretty active in the in the creative placemaking movement. And I've got a couple of slides that kind of speak to our work in that. Um, early on, you know, 2010 to 2012, roughly, um, we were pretty instrumental in some of the big wins in Memphis in getting um, some of our first dedicated bicycle infrastructure, um, some of the leadership changes in uh, city engineering staff, um, uh, revisiting some of our uh, city ordinances that have to do with bicycle and pedestrian safety. And more recently, I uh, have been involved in uh, some new leadership at our transit agency, which, of course, is also very important. You know, we talked about how important having the relationships with the city staff um, is to, to the success of these advocacy movements. Um, so I mentioned streets as places. Um, part of that has involved kind of embracing this uh, the idea of tactical urbanism or this kind of experimental approach uh, that we've seen in a number of cities around America. Um, just kind of rethinking the spaces in our streets. Uh, how do we make those more inviting as places for people to engage in a public realm? Um, we have taken that into this program that we've called MemFix. Um, where we've kind of tested out some of these new street designs and configurations. I know we saw a slide in Laura's show of the Better Block project that was kind of the inspiration uh, for this program. You may also have seen some of the, the hashtags about snack downs, the, the unused portions of the street that you can see very well when there's lots of snow on the ground. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of snow here in Memphis, but we do have very wide streets in a lot of places. Um, so here's just a quick illustration of a project we did last October uh, where we have a, an excessively built out street that we've you know, come in and done some pretty low cost um, redesigns of the street to kind of take some of that back for bicycling and pedestrian activity. Um, a lot of our bicycle infrastructure has been achieved through road diets because of the, the overbuilt streets that we have here. So I just like this slide as kind of a uh, direct illustration of some of those concepts. Um, all of this was painted, you know, by volunteers using traffic paint that you can get um, at your local paint store, most likely, um, and has been kind of a, pro a part of uh, rethinking about how we revitalize those um, small neighborhood spaces. So just to give a little context, um, uh, many of you may have heard that Memphis was on the you know, the list of worst bicycling cities for a number of years in a row. Uh, back in 2010, we had a grand total of 1.8 miles of dedicated uh, bike lanes. Uh, you can see over here in the projected column for next year, uh, with all of the federal and, and local projects that we've got coming up, we've, we've made a big leap in the dedicated facilities for bicycling. Um, you know, demographically, and we talk about mid-sized cities, and I guess that depends on how you're measuring it. In terms of population, we're most definitely mid-sized with about 650,000 residents. Uh, but our city is 350 square miles. Uh, it's about the same size as the city of Los Angeles. So that presents some very real challenges to bicycling, walking, and to transit. Um, I mentioned in 2010, that Livable Memphis was instrumental in this Walk Bike Memphis advocacy movement that brought in our local bicycle co-ops, our statewide bicycle, Bike Walk Tennessee, um, 
and was instrumental in changing the leadership in city engineering uh, that has made so much of this progress possible. Uh, we now have projects, you know, we've been a part of the Green Lane project. Uh, we're an adopter of the NACTO Urban, Design, Urban Streets Design Guide, as is our state DOT. Um, we've got a project that sh next year will have a, a bicycle and pedestrian river crossing of the Mississippi River with the Harahan Bridge. On the pedestrian side, it's um, definitely been a little more of an uphill battle since then. Um, we're in the midst of kind of trying to figure out how we address our growing um, need for sidewalk repairs and new pedestrian infrastructure. Um, we have about 3,500 miles of sidewalks. We've got a lot of people who walk to work. Um, we've got a lot of people who do not have access to a reliable vehicle. Um, so a lot of uh, households and people with disabilities who are relying on this uh, public infrastructure that we have in our sidewalk network. Um, how does that translate to something that's easily digestible in the public realm? We have about a $1.1 billion uh, asset or liability, depending on how you look at it, um, where if we dedicated about $20 million a year to sidewalk maintenance, uh, that would basically take care of our problem, but the, the political reality of getting that much funding for sidewalks, which aren't always the most exciting topic, is, is complicated. Um, and you can see here down at the bottom right, uh, in the past 10 years, we've spent less than $350,000 on sidewalk repair. And we're at a point right now where our, our repair program is stalled out because of some um, some concerns about the burden that that places on homeowners, uh, particularly because it is a property owner's responsibilities uh, here, or at least that's the system we're working under now. Um, so a lot of what we're doing now is um, working through our, our members organizations um, to really try and reach out to some of the decision makers to figure out how we're going to move forward uh, with funding pedestrian infrastructure. Um, one thing that we've done over the past couple of years is we've developed a toolkit for residents and neighborhood groups, whether they're uh, community development corporations, um, volunteers, neighborhood associations, to um, give them some information on walkability, why it's so important, give a little bit of that context, whether it's about safety or health or a more equitable transportation system, uh, and give them some tools to actually go out and assess um, walkability in their neighborhoods and some resources to actually follow up on that, uh, and whether it's through a campaign that advocates for uh, publicly funded improvements, uh, reaching out to neighbors about uh, repairing sidewalks, things like that. We wanted to make this as, uh, as easy to use as possible. Um, so we didn't go with a highly technical tool. We did kind of a pen and paper on a clipboard survey uh, that we've done in a few neighborhoods now. Uh, we do have access to a mobile app through one of our member CDCs um, that gives the opportunity to um, to a group to go out and internally track uh, sidewalk issues in their neighborhoods. But really, just trying to boil this down into you know, is a sidewalk cracked or broken? Where are they missing? Um, looking at some of the ramps and driveway issues, uh, as well as some of the obstructions, whether it's utility poles, um, temporary obstructions, things like that. Uh, another key, key piece of the toolkit is these, uh, these tools that give a neighborhood the, the information about um, what exists currently for repair programs, uh, what are the responsibilities for maintaining sidewalks. Um, gives them some kind of templates to use in reaching out both to neighbors as well as to uh, local officials, state officials. Um, and there's a pre-approved list of contractors that they can use through the city to make some of these sidewalk repairs. Um, as I mentioned, you know, currently our, our focus on this relies on property owners to fix their sidewalks. We realize that this is certainly not an ideal situation. So a big conversation that's going on now, as I mentioned, is how do we fund a more strategic approach um, to providing pedestrian infrastructure. Um, the city and 
you know, working with the city now on a, on a plan to address that that's based you know, around schools as kind of an easy sell politically, uh, but ends up capturing 85 to 90 percent of the city's sidewalks. Um, this is going to give us a, an actual strategic plan that prioritizes our biggest needs now uh, for sidewalks. Later this year, we're going to be going and advocating for between two and ten million dollars per year. Um, you know, we'd like to see ten. We we understand that uh, that could be tough. We may get two, but how how can that leverage some federal or state funding? Uh, that still doesn't get us to our nineteen million dollar a year. Um, repair needs. So we are going to have to also incorporate how, how uh, property owners can participate in this as well. So we're looking at some of the um, programs that might ease the burden on them, whether it's um, through just having a, an easier process for this, uh, for repairs, but also some financial incentives for property owners to make repairs to their sidewalks. Another project we've worked on in the past couple of years is uh, through a partnership with America Walks, we were able to convene a statewide uh, advocacy and policy team to kind of look at some of the common issues that are happening between uh, the communities in Tennessee, whether urban, suburban, or some of the smaller towns. Um, I'll apologize for the very uh, text-heavy slides here. It's hard to show this visually. Um, but what we focused on really was um, Again, policy, whether it's at the local level or even looking at some of the federal issues uh, with the highway bill, um, we did deploy uh, in three different communities around the state um, these focus groups that use the walkability toolkit to make assessments. Um, did one here in Memphis. We also did one in Nashville in conjunction with last year's um, Tennessee Bike Summit. Uh, and then looked at a smaller community in Dyersburg kind of how the small town would address these issues. They had actually already done, <coughs> excuse me, uh, an assessment of their sidewalk network using high school students. So we went in and just kind of talked to them about uh, what worked, what didn't, how our toolkit matched up with that, and what we could offer uh, in terms of resources or assistance for moving that forward. Um, and then we generated a just a list of general findings and recommendations for policy um, and advocacy going forward. You can see over here on the on the right hand side, we had a pretty robust group of um, organizations represented there, um, reaching out into health departments, YMCA. We had Safe Routes involved, uh, some private foundations, as well as your your transportation planning agencies uh, from several cities and from the state. Um, some of those recommendations were, you know, making pedestrian considerations a routine part of statewide programs that are using some of this uh, safety money. Um, typically, those are a very data-driven process. So they're, they're where you can uh, point to the greatest need in terms of crashes, injuries, and deaths. Um, so the state has actually developed a model because we don't, you know, the pedestrian crashes don't achieve the same uh, rate as automobile crashes, but they now have a model where they can um, say based on the roadway characteristics and things like that where the greatest likelihood of pedestrian um, incidents would be. And that gives them an opportunity to redirect some of that HSIP money towards um, projects at those locations. Uh, we've also advocated for kind of expanding some of these other funding programs um, to target uh, pedestrian and bicycle issues, whereas previously they've been primarily on distracted driving, which of course is a pedestrian and bicycle safety issue, um, distracted and impaired driving. And so the last thing I'm going to talk about is um, complete streets in Memphis. Um, we were the 500th uh, complete streets policy around the country that was adopted. And to talk about our role in helping the city develop uh, the manual that's going to help implement uh, this policy. So, you know, I put here a, a soft approach to complete streets. Um, with the change in leadership in city engineering, we definitely started seeing um, 
movement towards uh, better designed streets for bicyclists and pedestrians, transit users, for, for all users of the roads. Um, but we didn't really see it fully institutionalized. You know, I would even get a call from our city's bike ped coordinator and say, well, hey, did you see there's a new bike lane over on X Street um, that he hadn't even been aware of. You know, it just had kind of become a part of uh, public works and engineering's process, but without a real um, official guide to how that was happening. Um, some of the challenges that we've faced in implementing complete streets, obviously, and you know, these are going to look pretty similar uh, to a lot of communities around the country, whether it's design, uh, funding, who has control over the road, is it a local road or a state road. Um, politics comes into play, especially when you talk about funding. Uh, and again, the process and, and how do we build um, public support for these things. Again, you know, having the NACTO guide adopted here has helped with design and some of these um, procedural things. Uh, we, we've made pretty good use of funding by doing road diets, not relying on gigantic capital projects for the most part, but kind of tying these things in with uh, resurfacing projects and maintenance projects. Um, so Livable Memphis convened um, a Complete Streets Coalition that uh, went to work on some of these issues and getting a, a, a policy of sorts in place. Uh, that was done through executive order that said um, within two years we're going to have uh, a plan for implementing complete streets in the city of Memphis. Um, we realized pretty early on that you know there are plenty of good resources out there for design. What we really needed to focus on was how do we standardize how projects move through the process in city government. Um, look at some of the kind of ongoing institutional challenges, um, looking at how these things are communicated between city departments. Um, and so this manual provides that justification for how better design uh, fits into the picture and requires kind of a, a, a real solid argument um, when you're saying, well, we have to deviate from this design. Um, so we had Active Transportation Alliance out of Chicago who helped us in developing this manual. Um, and it's got two main parts. Like I mentioned, there is a design element to it that puts things in kind of context of what we need here in Memphis, but also that project delivery workbook that helps these uh, roadway projects move through city agencies. Um, so this is really taking a case-by-case -case basis, really contextually um, making considerations based on land use. Uh, Memphis is a big freight town, so we, we've had the intersection of freight and bike ped issues uh, come out in this, uh, in this manual, but also looking at some of the future plans for um, land use uh, and roadways in the, in the city. We've also changed up um, kind of how we design and, and designing really from pedestrians through vehicles to make sure that the, the, the users with the most needs are, are the highest in that order of considerations. And then finally, we've offered some of these um, cross sections to really visualize how these projects will play out and, and how streets fit into that public realm, this, again, streets as places. Um, we've given clearly defined allocations within the right-of-way, but still allowed for some flexibility, um, understanding that so much of Memphis is built out already, that um, a lot of these projects are going to have to fit into existing uh, situations. And then again, finally, that uh, the process for how these projects move through um, planning, engineering, utilities, uh, all of the different uh, agencies that are involved in different aspects of the, the public space and streets. Um, it really just sets a routine process, really deals with how communications work between those departments, and provides documentation of the decision-making processes, and also clearly defines when we're engaging the public uh, in, these, in these processes. So with that, um, you can find out more about what we're doing at livablememphis.org, um, but I, I think we'll open it for questions now. Turn this back over. Okay, thank you for those presentations.
Uh, if you have not done so already, please go ahead and enter your question into the question box, and we'll try to get to it. Uh, I do want to mention that uh, the presentation slides are going to be available for download at headbikeinfo.org slash webinars, and within about a week we'll have a recording of the presentation. Uh, so they, they will be posted and you'll be able to access them there. I've gotten that question several times, so I want to answer that. Uh, but the first question I got, and I've gotten this one a, a few times as well, is, uh, is the number of pages in this guide seems overwhelming for a public guide. Are you considering publishing a summary version or a shorter version that could easily be printed by advocacy groups uh, to share with their members? That's a great question. And I will say we had that conversation many times when we were developing the guide, how to balance all the great ideas with the need to be fairly succinct. And so I will point people to the resource sheet number one. It's intended to be kind of a pocket version with some of the key messages of the guide. And also, we are intending to provide um, all the resources to be downloaded separately, as well as the case studies um, separately from the main four chapters of the guide. Um, so that's something that we're hoping to have up on um, PBIC's website, as well as um, working with FHWA, um, so that you could download just specific pieces instead of the entire 100-page guide. Tamara, do you want to add anything about printing the guide? Um, I hope to have money to print it in the next few months or so. But if anybody really wants to print a copy, we still have printed copies of the old version um, in huge quantities. So that is available. The information is still relevant. It just doesn't have the new bike information um, or some of the new case studies. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, this next question is for uh, Eva and Ramiro. Um, do you know what percentage of the population work in Brownsville? Do most people work outside of Brownsville and therefore to commute farther? And how much of an impact does that have on, on walking and bicycling in the area? That is a good question. I do not have a percentage of how many people work in Brownsville, although I'm sure it's in the census. Um, although I do not think... Uh, we don't have a big percentage of people commuting to other cities, but we do have a percentage of people coming in from Mexico. There are a lot of people who live in our sister city of Matamoros who across the bridge um, practically every day to come work here. I, I don't have the, the, the percentage. I wish I did, so I'm sorry for that. Okay, that thank a, you. Okay. Um, Next question, this one's for John Paul. Uh, how did you coordinate with transportation agencies so that volunteers could actually paint the road diet design? That's a great question. Um, the first of those uh, events was done with the city's knowledge, but with an understanding that it would be a kind of a temporary redesign. Um, it ended up not being so temporary. Um, this was on Broad Avenue. Um, but since then, that's, that's become an official project. We're actually doing a, a cycle track project through there based on that, that conceptual design. Um, after that first event, the city, we had a lot of support, and Memfix actually was a program of um, our mayor's innovation delivery team. Basically, Bloomberg Philanthropies went to six cities around the country um, and said, we're going to find a team that is focused on innovation in government, innovation in how the government delivers services, how we think about government's role, how they engage the community. So they came up with this idea for Memfix. Um, the first couple of events were, again, temporary infrastructure changes. So they'd go out and they'd use chalk paint, um, temporary tape to stripe you know, a buffered bike lane or something like that, new crosswalks. Um, but after the first couple of those events, we realized, well, you know what, we can do some kind of leave behinds. Um, so there have been two events now where we've actually done some of those bump outs, kind of plaza spaces. Uh, and basically, you know, we come up with the conceptual design, um, design it out, get approval from the engineering department, and, and then get our volunteers together. They'll, they'll, engineering will come out and actually chalk out the design. Um, just as an outline, and, and we go in and, and paint that and, and 
firm it up. Uh, they did support us with, you know, they'll provide some signs or something like that. We added a stop sign in that one picture I'd shown. Um, so they'll actually come out and do some of that hard infrastructure. All right, thank you. The next question, uh, this goes back to, to Brownsville. Um, you, you, you mentioned the surveys that you used. Is it possible to make this available for other attendees, or do you have them posted online anywhere? Um, the surveys that we did at the Sombrero Festival were mostly um, through, they were for the development of the bicycle, the hike and bike master plan. Um, the ones that we do at the Cyclobias, uh, although I'm not, I don't think they're available for the public right now, I'm definitely sure that I can post them up. Um, I can send them to you and you can send them out for, for other people to see them. But those are basic, those are about like how active people are. They're about, you know, how, if, if they're commuting to work through their bikes or if they're walking. Um, so I, I can share that information, but they're not up for publicly right now. All right, that'd be great. If you send them to me, I'll put them on our, our webinar uh, page with the presentation slides and the video. Sure. Um, following up on that, John Paul, you mentioned uh, a walkability toolkit you used in your Memphis project. Is that available online? Um, and if not, is it possible to make it available? I can add it. We, we just launched a new website last month, so I'm still putting content up. But I will make sure it is up there uh, by the end of the day. Great, thank you. Uh, John Paul, can you talk more about how uh, Tennessee has gone about making the argument for including pedestrian safety as part of the HS, HSIP funding process? What types of risk factors have been identified, and is there a copy of this document somewhere available online? Um, you know, I'm not 100% sure that there is a document available online at the moment. Um, I think they did something similar with um, kind of how um, some of these bicycle or pedestrian level of service or suitability indexes have been done. Uh, it was done through the University of Tennessee. Um, I, I believe it's you know roadway like lane width, roadway width, speed. Um, I, I could certainly find out some more information about that. Um, it's you know, that, that has been kind of a barrier, um, using that HSIP money. Um, so I think just coming up with that kind of technical tool that it kind of gets you into that data-driven process has been very important for that. All right, thank you. Uh, going back to, to Eva and uh, Romero, can you talk more about uh, the information resources you have for the, the Bike Pledge program? Um, the bike pledge program, I'm sorry? Yes. Yeah, we do not have a bike pledge program. Um, I think that the, oh, the bike pledge, that's just an activity that people use. We don't really follow through on, you know, who's sticking to their pledge. It's just when they come to Ciclovia, we want to encourage them, of course, to, to bike more. So BC Workshop, which is the nonprofit design firm and community development corporation of Brownsville, um, this is just sort of an activity that, you know, once you see the statistics, the benefits, what, how you can really make an impact um, on your day-to-day -day life by making this pledge, it's just a way to encourage them. So I don't think there's a list of how many people have pledged um, through this activity. Um, it's just it's it's just sort of an engagement tool. All right, thank you. Uh, my next question also uh, is is for Eva and Romero. Um, mm -hmm. How were you able to require the attendance of city staff at the presentation? So this is sort of a good point. Um, I I like how John Paul's presentation is a lot about how the advocacy groups work to push the city to do things. In Brownsville, it is oddly the opposite. Um, you know, our city staff and mostly our commissioners and city manager, um, they really understand the problem that we face um, health-wise. 
And so when we bring or when other partnerships have invested in bringing these experts down, it was sort of um, an email sent from above to all the directors in all the city departments. Like it is required of you, a director or a representative of your department, to attend these um, to attend these these education, these visions, these lecture series. That's how it worked for us. Um, you know, our city managers on board, and so it sort of had to trickle down into all the other city departments. And if I can add, this is John Paul. I mean, there there has been an element of that on our end as well. Um, engineering has been pretty bought in, and we'll see it kind of move into some of the other departments. Um, but particularly with with the Memphix um, and with Complete Streets, we've seen a lot of that leadership come from the mayor's office, uh, and really just kind of directing and encouraging um, the departments and and department directors uh, to send someone to be involved in those processes. Mm -hmm. Following up on that a little bit, you mentioned uh, engineering is involved. What, if anything, specifically can you point to that's, that's been successful in getting your, your city engineers to keep bicycles and sidewalks uh, on the top of their minds when planning new streets or, or redoing roads and, and not letting them be afterthoughts? Um, well, I'll just say really quickly in Brownsville, the adopting most of those resolutions or ordinances through the city commission has required them to to never put it on the back burner. It's always now the complete streets have to be part of city development. And it's every new project that goes through engineering, they have to consider it. It's just the directors know and um, and, and definitely they have to follow the ordinance now. Right. And in Memphis, I mean, having this complete streets uh, policy and process in place is is how we kind of enshrine that long term. Um, you know, we were a member of the Green Lane project, and that was pretty instrumental in getting uh, some of the key officials involved in this. Um, you know, taking them to other cities, uh, whether in the U.S. or abroad, um, to actually show them some of these kind of uh, model cities for bicycling, particularly bicycling. Um, but you know, they get to see a new version of pedestrian realms as well while they're in those those situations. Um, but really, you know, having them see that firsthand has been incredibly important into making sure that this is just kind of a routine what part of how we uh, how we design streets. It becomes a norm, almost. Exactly. Getting positive praise in national kind of a setting helps as well. <laughs> it incentivizes that. Well, Fully, I mean, it's great to have support for all these things. Um, what about getting officials to put, you know, to actually fund some of these projects? What, is, what have you done to, to, to get them to put the, their money behind these projects as well? Um, well, in Brownsville, um, our Office of Grant Management has really done a wonderful job of working with, you know, the planners, the engineers, um, and, and just the city in general to leverage funds. So. The Brownsville has been really um, lucky in only having to give, you know, the match, the 20% matching requirement, and most of our our big projects get funded through other organizations. So um, I forgot the number right now, but we have a trail that's coming in, and we were awarded over 4.2 million dollars. I want to say five million dollars for a trail through our um, transportation. Um, I'm sorry, through the the TAP program through our Texas DOT, and we we also got a transportation enhancement pro project that um, will make a connection through downtown. So um, we officials sort of can't. It's really hard for them to say no when you already got 80 percent of the funds to do a project, and once you have that fund, then they're more likely to say, okay, we'll will give you the 20% match that you need. No matter what that amount is, um, there, it, it's the leveraging of funds that's always going to be in your favor. Yeah, I, I would echo that from, from Memphis' standpoint. Um, to give credit, you know, our MPO has made um, some of these considerations such a routine part of their ranking process that, I mean, 
you'll see practically all major capital projects, not just in Memphis, but in, in the county and even across some other lines um, being made, you know, as part of those road projects. At the same time, you know, Memphis has been, again, really smart in how they've used some of these fundings. Um, you know, we'll go and we'll resurface a road. We'll say, well, we carve out six feet on either side of the road for bicycle lanes or something like that. We're, we're still maintaining, you know, we're doing a road diet, but in a lot of cases our road diets don't even involve lane reconfigurations. It's literally just narrowing lanes. Um, so I think if you pull out some of these like major, major capital projects like the Harahan Bridge or the Hamp Line, I, I'd say our spending on on new bicycle infrastructure has been, you know, under a couple of million dollars in the past two or three years because of the way we've leveraged funding and existing maintenance programs. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Um, this uh, goes back to Ivan Romero. How have you worked with or plan to work with uh, the University of Texas uh, School of Public Health to measure and evaluate how your various uh, pedestrian and bicycle efforts are ultimately impacting the health of Brownsville residents, particularly the health outcomes identified in the first couple of slides? Um, so the School of Public Health is, is always sort of at the table. And they have a, a year, every year they do the, the Brownsville's Biggest Loser. Now it's called the Challenge. And we get thousands or more of our population to participate. And, you know, it's a weight loss challenge, but they're always, um, they, they do all the data collection for the city, essentially. I mean, for themselves, of course, for their grants. But every year they, they sort of attract the same people, most of the people who started the challenge four years ago regularly do the challenge every year. And those questions, when you apply to do the challenge or when you end the challenge, there's sort of like a, an application in and an application out that you answer, you know, do you use the facilities? How often are you walking to somewhere? How often are you biking to somewhere? Those Ciclovia surveys, they are tracking how active our community is. And, you know, our first Ciclovia, I believe, was in 2012. So we can sort of see if there's a change or not, um, you know, through our population and, and how we bring people to, um, to, to us, I suppose. Um, so yeah, the University of Texas at Brownsville, they, they do all the, the research and they do all the surveying and they're, the, they're a big part of the data collection. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question is for John Paul. You mentioned using an app to gather sidewalk inventory and note the issues. Can you tell us a little more about that app or, or any others that you might know of that, were, that proved useful? Sure. Um, that is the only one we've used so far. This, the city used to have um, kind of a click it, fix it app um, that fell out of use a little bit with a kind of a reorganization of the mayor's the, the action center, the call center they have to take complaints. Um, they now have kind of an online um, tool for that. Um, the app that I mentioned was actually developed by one of our member uh, community development corporations. Um, they developed it um, as a tool for them to look at uh, vacant and blighted properties. So it's actually based on a, it's a parcel by parcel basis. Um, you'll go out, it'll, you know, geolocate you, associate the, the parcel that's there, kind of guide you through, is this the correct location? Um, and so they knew that we had been doing some of this work around uh, sidewalks, uh, pedestrian infrastructure maintenance, and, you know, they had their developer just kind of scale that down and give us a couple of check marks for, you know, sidewalk needs repair or, or um, sidewalks obstructed. So it's still based on the parcel. Um, you, you can uh, snap a picture and it, you can go log in online and it lets you kind of track internally. It, it's not integrated with the city system yet, but there has been some talk of how do we kind of bridge that gap, um, also bridging that system between our environmental court, which is where a lot of these kind of blight and maintenance issues um, go when you make a complaint. Um, so basically, you know, we just we benefited from one of our members' works in um, in housing redevelopment and kind of blight remediation. All right, thank you. 
Um, you, you both mentioned uh, complete streets uh, in your communities. Can you talk a little more about how that's being applied? Is it is it only into um, new areas that are or that are being developed? Is it in redevelopment of areas, or are uh, parcels being designed or streets being redesigned in complete street areas, sort of randomly around town? Uh, you know, for us in Memphis, it has been kind of piece by piece. Um, that's one of the big considerations for how this really gets implemented because, you know, let's say a, a developer comes in and redevelops a parcel, you know, in a core neighborhood, how much of the street are they actually going to be affecting? Um, but I think having this plan in place and kind of identifying some of our, our growth corridors and things like that gives us more leverage saying, well, yes, we're asking you to widen the sidewalk here and create more of a pedestrian realm um, because it is part of a, a bigger plan to transform one of these corridors. Um, one of the things that we're focusing on from the land use side as a policy issue is um, getting a real kind of strategic redevelopment authority in place. So I think we'll see some of this come, come to play a little bit more as we start assembling land inside the city. Uh, for some of the larger developments, um, obviously, you know, we're as a city trying to stop kind of edge development. So it, the complete streets manual is going to have to really work in that kind of redevelopment mode, um, of working with existing streets. How do we, you know, kind of transform these things? Um, engineering and public works can use it kind of from a corridor perspective when they do go in and and do a, a maintenance project or a resurfacing project. Right. Um, so each street is not created equally, and um, when while engineering has their own budget to resurface streets, they do create um, a bike lane. It's not always easy to make sure that they can implement a sidewalk when sidewalks cost more. Um, so for us, it has been um, you know in pieces. We're not specifically enhancing one area. We try not, we have four districts and we're trying not to leave out any one, but um, a lot of the funding that allows us to create trails um, or the road diet and so on will allow us to create better sidewalks and create a better protected facilities. Um, I wish it was like enhancing one area at a time, but we are trying to create a network. So we, we meet us at the planning department, we meet with the traffic and engineering to see, you know, what roads are in their budget to surf, resurface this year, and how do they connect to the existing facilities, and then, you know, we identify the ones that are not in their budget, and we try to either seek funding for enhancing those or, um, yeah, just creating the complete streets. We have a county regional mo mobility authority, and they're developing new roads you know, um, for for transportation, for like truck access. So we work with, with whether it's a new road, whether we're resurfacing a road, or whether we're just um, picking out existing roads that don't, that aren't going to be resurfaced. And we try to do our best, little by little, to, to get the complete streets in all of our major corridors. All right, thank you. And uh, I think my last question today is, um, Whenever we talk about uh, removing lanes, narrowing lanes, taking out on-street parking, uh, there's never really a group that comes out against that. Uh, they don't want to lose lanes. They don't want to lose parking. What advice could you give to uh, other communities to get those people on your side to see the benefit in the changes you're making uh, to add in the complete streets perspective, to putting bike lanes in, um, maybe replacing parking with, with new travel lanes for bicyclists or pedestrians. What what have you done and what tips do you have for others? Um, you know, fortunately here in Memphis, like I said, most of those road diets, you know, even if we do a lane configuration, very rarely have we had to remove on-street parking. Um, so that's eased it a little bit. Um, but I think this is kind of one of those situations where, in a lot of cases, they're just going to have to see it work. Um, you know, our first big road diet battle was on Madison Avenue um, about three years ago. 
and we did you know a four lane two in each direction down to a one and one with a center turn lane um, installed bike lanes it it helped that there was a big redevelopment project uh, at one end of the street that was going on and they were supportive of it um, we did have about a 50 50 split with businesses so really kind of working with the businesses who were on board um, we actually were able to add on street parking in that situation so I don't know you know we at least had kind of an olive branch to offer um, but really going out and, and getting what everyone's involvement early on that was something we actually had to hold additional public meetings because we you know it was just kind of realized that this wasn't going to be uh, the easiest of cells but I think just getting everyone to the table and really trying to figure out you know what's our goal for the corridor like are, are we trying to move cars through here as quickly as possible or are we really trying to create um, a place that's you know that's got a lot of more economic activity um, a safer place for people to be in general um, and you know everything worked out on that project and it's it's kind of provided that model to see the next time we come out and say well we want to kind of rethink how the streets designed here it's worked out on Madison Avenue you know can, can we move forward with this new project um, yeah in in our case in Brownsville the road diet that we have completed um, at the beginning, there are a lot of people complaining, and I don't think they stop complaining until the project is done, but you do have to let them know the reasons for it. And in our case, the area that we did it in wasn't necessarily for economic development, but it was in one of like the lowest income neighborhoods that we have, and there's a school nearby. So when you bring in how many people or students walk or bike to school at that school, I think the percentage was about 40 to 50 percent of students walk and bike to that school. So, you know, we were like, to the people who, who were against the road diet, we asked them to take into consideration the amount of low-income families around the area, the amount of youth that walk or bike to this school, and how we are trying to create a healthy, active transportation type of environment for our city. And like I said, I don't think it actually um, made them feel better or change their mind, at least not to everyone, but it at least allowed them to sort of really sit back and, and it, it gave us the permission to ourselves that we needed to push through these unhappy citizens. Um, so there, there will be a battle, I mean an uphill battle, it's not easy to create change when they're so used to being able to speed down a road and now they have to go slower or you know they can't be cutting in and out of other other lanes so um, yeah I mean just keep pushing this, this is John Paul again this is another one of those situations where if you have the opportunity to do kind of a, a test project um, kind of going back to that tactical urbanism test it before you fully implement something um, the city's actually taken that approach with our Riverside Drive project where we had a two lane in each direction um, median separated roadway where they took all, an entire half of the road and dedicated it to bike pad um, you know taking it down to two lanes well they're, they're saying you know this was a one-year pilot program we're going to go back and when we actually do the permanent infrastructure and repave and everything uh, we're going to test this out and see what kind of changes we need to make. Um, so if that opportunity kind of presents itself, um, that, that can be a good way to kind of do that demonstration project. All right, great. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have today for discussion. I'm sorry if we did not get to your questions. Uh, again, a PDF copy of the presentation slides is available at headbikeinfo.org slash webinars under the a Residence Guide for Creating Safer Communities for Walking and Biking tab. Um, and later this week we will post, or within a couple weeks, we'll post a video of the, the webinar as well. And we'll also post that to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash headbikeinfo. Uh, be sure to follow us on Facebook for updates on when those are posted. Uh, you can follow us at facebook.com slash headbike. Finally, I want to remind you that a very brief survey will appear once the webinar is ended. We very much appreciate you taking a moment to complete it. 
And I want to thank our speakers again, Tamara Redmond, Laura Sant, Eva Garcia, Ramiro Gonzalez, and John Paul Schaefer for their presentation today. And thank you to all of you for attending our PBIC Liberal Communities webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.